it's my privilege this morning to um, introduce our guest speaker. Um, this is a young man who is a husband, a father, the executive pastor here. He's an author. He's a poet. Uh, he's an all-around good guy. Um, Anthony has, we just really honor you, Anthony, for who you are and what you bring to Seattle Revival Center. And so would you help me welcome Pastor Anthony this morning. So good. So good. Please be seated. Wait, you're seated. All right. Please stand up so I can seat you back down. All right. Come on. Thanks, Sandy. Love you. Um, it's so good. Uh, you know, excited to uh, be bringing the word today. And God's got a lot to say to us. Paul has a lot to say to us, and it's going to be great. We've been getting a ton out of this um, uh, uh, Church Under Fire series. And look around, guys. It's a packed house right now. Come on. Just take a moment to look around. Because, uh, you know, it really is uh, God growing the church right now. And he's doing this across the board. And he is uh, preparing us uh, for the outpouring that he is doing because he is awakening his body. And he is uh, pouring out his spirit upon all flesh in this hour. And it's a powerful time to be alive. Amen. Come on. And so, uh, you know, our third service is going to be awesome. And, uh, and we need to be praying for our uh, children's ministry team because um, my wife was just down in the toddler room and they had close to 25 kids in there. Hey, 25 toddlers. Hey, what? Just kidding. They're, it's like one to four, but 25 of those kids, you know, come on. It's crazy. So, I mean, we're bursting at the seams. Emily's doing an awesome, awesome job. And we're growing our team. Yeah, come on. Come on. It's so cool to see our teams expand and uh, kind of level up and more people come into the fold of the squad to, you know, uh, to really expand um, what God is doing in and through us. So it's really great. But be praying for the children's ministry. Be praying for the youth. The youth has a record number of kids. We've never had this many kids in, in the youth group ever, right? So, I mean, I don't know about way, way history, you know, back then. But in, at least in the time that I've been here, um, and my wife was a youth pastor, killing it, killing it. Um, but... Uh, but I think we're averaging at about like 28 kids right now. So every Sunday. So it's just an awesome, awesome season to be a part. And if you're like, hey, well, I love youth. Or, hey, I love children. Or, hey, I love to work in the media department. Come chat with us. We'd love to add you to the team and, uh, and have you uh, volunteer a little bit, serve, and, and get plugged in. So awesome. Awesome. Well, hey, before we get started, wanted to shout out the Garcias are in the house. Hey, hey. Julio and Natalie. Come on. Julio and Natalie uh, faithfully serve um, as our, our youth pastors here uh, for a season uh, before God called them uh, on to some adventures. And, uh, and now it's just awesome that you guys are uh, in, in the neck of the woods. And I wasn't sure if you guys were going to come through. So it's, it's awesome. Thanks, guys, for coming out. Come on. It was a drive, I know. So, yeah. But, um, but yeah, you guys, we're going we're gonna to jump back into uh, our Church Under Fire series Darren's down in Texas shooting some footage and probably shooting some type of animal, you know. Come on. Yeah, that's right. You hunt, bro. You do that. And uh, all right. <laughs> and that is a thread that's going to be here. I am going to trigger you today, all right. So if you don't like hunting, there's going to be other stuff that you don't like that I will say today. But guess what? Paul said it. Oh, yeah. You can blame Paul, Okay. And if you want to blame Paul, you can just wait until you go to heaven and re try to remember that <laughs> for you to blame him. Awesome. Well, this is starting out great. This is a great time <laughs> to segue into prayer. All right, let's do that. <laughs> so good. All right. Um, real quick before we do that, uh, uh, Darren's down at as I mentioned, at Open Door uh, Church with Troy Brewer Ministries. And the reason why that is significant is this uh, December, we uh, went after the Red Envelope Project, which we do um, every year. And we've been expanding it year after year. And this year, uh, we 
um, uh, continued with our goal of raising $25,000 uh, for five different projects. And we met our goal, which is awesome and amazing. And guess what? We had an overflow. Everybody say overflow. Overflow. <laughs> So much of an overflow that we ended up sending, drum roll please, 26000 I didn't even give you a chance to drum roll, $182.92. And the reason why that's significant is because we sent that down to Troy Brewer Ministries because they are endeavoring, they've built a wineskin or a structure or a ministry to uh, save uh, girls and boys out of the sex trafficking industry. Yeah, that's right. And, and Troy tells the story of like, hey, we, God just told me to do it, so we went and did it. He, he uh, mortgaged his house about seven times, I believe, and uh, just to pay for uh, children to be, he, he's literally buying children out of the sex trade, which is literally, he's paying money for lives which is illegal, and, um, but God calls us to uh, go and bring those who are in darkness into the light. Amen? And so that is uh, what Troy Brewer has done, and he's built this wineskin. He's really built a structure for converting money into uh, rescuing people out of slavery. And uh, isn't it awesome that God gives us the ability to not just have money, but to also build structures and wineskins that convert that money into kingdom endeavors. Yeah. And so that is one thing that, uh, that God is teaching us in this hour, that uh, I'm giving you blueprints and strategies to bring freedom to the captives, to set the priv- prisoners free, to bring sight to the blind, to heal the lame. Come on, to do the Isaiah 61. And that's what I'm so excited to see is that uh, this budding relationship uh, that's happening uh, with Troy Brewer Ministries. And so, so it's not just about hunting, but hunting is going to be awesome. Okay. All right. There you go. I've never hunted, but I, I like that show, Meat Eater. Anybody watch that show? Nobody watches it. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Let's pray. Hey. <laughs> it's great. All right. Okay. You guys having fun? All right. Okay. Um, uh, my message today is called Bringing the Kingdom Where You Are. Um, hey, Father, thank you uh, that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that you love me and that you... Uh, that you're proud of me and that you um, are, uh, are rooting for me. And I thank you, Lord, that that's what you do for all of us, God, that you are so proud of us, that you are so rooting for us and you're so for us. You're not against us. And, uh, and you cause us to see what we never saw before. And, uh, and it's amazing and you, uh, and, and you bring your kingdom through us and it's such a privilege. So, Lord, cause us to be expanded today cause us to have aha moments, cause us to see more clearly than we've ever seen, and cause us to be shifted into an activated state as uh, as sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, verse 17 of chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, we've been uh, going after it. Paul is uh, writing in a letter to the Corinthians. Uh, The first portion of this letter is addressing, addressing instances of, or issues that need to be fixed. And then he pivots uh, within this last chapter um, into answering questions or specific things like, um, should we eat this or, or, or um, regarding uh, uh, being single or married. And, and you know, Darren really dived into uh, the importance of recognizing the grace uh, on you uh, for specific things. And Paul saying, look, you know, today I want you to remain as you are. No matter where you are, I want you to remain there. And so um, it's going to be good. Verse 17, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a slave when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself to the opportunity. For he who who was called in the Lord as a slave 
is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let him remain with God. There let him remain with God. Amen. So, um, so he gives us a couple examples that we're going to unpack. But before we do that, I want to get at kind of the, the anchor uh, scriptures that cause us to see his point, understand the, the point of what he's saying. And so you find that in, in verses 17, verses 20, and verse 24, um, as they are all in one way a reiteration of the same point. So I'm going to read those together. Uh, verse 17, it says, Let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. Verse 20, Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. And verse 24, So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. So just breaking this down, Paul is saying, Serve the Lord where you are. Wherever you were placed, let God shine his light through you there. He's saying, Be content where you are, because ultimately your contentment doesn't come from where you are. It comes from Jesus. Paul is also addressing a culture shock that's happening in the, the uh, Corinthians um, because it was a pagan culture, meaning they didn't have any Christian values like we do here um, as a country. Our country, in a lot of ways, has a general sense of Christian values. It's woven in. It's put on our money, etc. And where we aren't necessarily following it to a T, meaning you can't just be American and assume that you're going to be a Christian, right? Right? Like, you can't just do one in order to do the other. You still have to make sure that you're putting that first. Um, there's a whole good amount of undergirding that exists within American society. In Corinth, that was not the case. And so you have uh, some people were using their newfound grace in Christ to have a license to sin, and some were swinging to the other side of the pendulum and refusing to have sex with their wives in order to be more righteous. So this portion of the letter in context is Paul setting some of these things straight by fatherly addressing the concerns one by one. And today he gets to the heart of the matter. So, you know, some might say, you know, what if I was a drunkard or I was addicted to drugs? You're saying, should I stay and remain in that state? Should I stay in there? And, and obviously, many of us aren't probably asking this, but just to be thorough, I'm going to go there. So, of course not. You know, 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Paul isn't saying to stay in darkness, but to stay in the state of which you were called. So, you know, if you were an addict to drugs, you now, now are an addict to the Lord. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. That word condition is the Greek word klesis, which means a calling. From the Greek word kaleo, which means to call or summon. Used of God inviting all people to receive his gift of salvation. So when, when Paul's talking about when you were called or your calling, he's talking about when Jesus saved you. When Jesus encountered you and brought you into his kingdom, he's not saying when, when you received your scroll of what you're supposed to do with your life or, or, or when you were called into ministry per se, as many of us know. So just kind of divide that. It's, it's really talking about our core calling. For all of us, our call is to follow the Lord, is to be in communion with Jesus, is to follow him, is to serve him, is to allow that following to transform us wherever we are. So uh, that word, um, so the Passion Translation defines it as living faithful in the situation of life in which they were called to follow Jesus. And the commentary from verse 20 in, in the Passion Translation says, Paul is teaching that no matter what a person's situation is in life, the real change needed is not just in circumstances, but in a heart that is willing to be faithful to God in all things. We often wish we could be in different circumstances instead of looking for opportunities to serve God where we are. 
And, I, and that really hit me, you know, because I feel like uh, when we become believers, uh, there's this human tendency to want to work out our salvation humanly. There's this human tra- uh, uh, thing to say, okay, well, now that means that I need to do this, this, and this. And that's what Paul was dealing with, and we'll, and we'll dive into that a bit as we get into the example of, of circumcision. You know, you, you had people coming in and thinking that they needed to become something culturally that, uh, in, in order to justify what happened inside. And, uh, and what Paul is saying is, no, don't do that. <laughs> so God, God calls people to himself in various uh, situations in life, whether this be economic, uh, whether this be marital, whether you're single or married, um, whether this be uh, religious, you know, uh, whether you, you're culturally a Jew or, or you're a Gentile. But he, in doing this, he often has a purpose for that new believer in that very situation. So the point is this, that wherever you are called, God called you for a purpose, and he didn't call you necessarily out of that specific place where you were saved. He actually has a purpose for you there. So one important piece to note is that uh, where people were when they were saved was no accident. And I think about this, um, you know, because it taking, you know, God takes care to place us in specific families. He takes care to put us uh, speaking specific languages in different cities, in different tribes and tongues. Amen. And we're put in all these different places. And the, the image that I think about is, uh, is uh, like Jason Bourne, the Bourne Identity or something. Um, all the dudes are like, yeah. And the ladies are like, oh, my gosh. Whatever. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, Bourne. Um, but, you know, like it's the CIA. And they have all of these operatives. And they're placed in all of these different countries and cultures. They speak different languages. And they're, uh, and they're placed there. And then someone in this, like, control room presses a button and they're, like, activated. And they start beating everybody up. You know, like, that's how it works, right? That's, if you want to know, that's, like, the breakdown, you know. You're welcome. Um, yeah. So now that you have this newfound knowledge... Um, you know, there you go. Um, but, you know, like, it's a great example of the kingdom uh, because we are all placed in all these different locations for different purposes, um, with different strategies, with different understandings, with different cultural um, uh, 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 awarenesses, with different languages, with, um, with different climates. You get the picture, but we're all placed there uh, purposely. And... God is way more strategic, powerful, and multifaceted than the CIA. Way more. And that's and that's the reality that Paul is trying to highlight. Is he's saying, um, no, you don't need to change your culture. You need to catch what just happened. You need to catch what happened inside of you and just remain where you are because I promise you as you you start to honor this communion you have with the Lord where you are, you're going to start to see yourself activated and you're going to start to see the kingdom unfold where you are and you're going to start to bring something that you never really ever even fathomed and uh, and it's going to be awesome. So... You are a kingdom operative with a special assignment designed for you to execute. I've also been uh, chewing on this this verse in Ephesians 3.10. It says, So through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now, everybody say now. Now. As Pastor Darren was saying in the video, God is doing a ton of amazing stuff right now. Now. It's not tomorrow. It's not maybe next year. It's a right now thing. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. I'll break that down. So the word manifold means taking various forms. Or of many different kinds. God's wisdom has many aspects and facets. 
like an intricately cut diamond, it's, it's a perfect display of complexity all in one. Rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, that's talking about angels and beings. God's redemptive purposes are of interest to angels. Catch this. And the whole host of heaven who are, who are better able to glorify God when they behold and wonder what God has done and does in creating the church. This is unpacked even further in 1 Peter 1.12 where it says, The gospel containing wonderful mysteries that even the angels long to get a glimpse of. So the, uh, the Passion Translation has a great footnote um, of this uh, verse in 1 Peter where it's talking about them longing to get this uh, glimpse of it. And it basically says this, Heavenly angels are fascinated with God's mercy shown toward us. His wise plan of making former rebels into lovers has mystified the angelic realm. The church is the university of angels and every believer a professor. Angels long to peer into the mysteries of God's grace, which have been lavished upon us. How much more should we be fascinated explorers of the mercy of God, for we have received it and are now redeemed. You guys, Paul is, is saying, you just don't get it. Like, you just don't get it. Like, you don't understand what Jesus has done in you. And therefore, you don't understand who you really are. You know, the other day, the Lord nudged me and he said, I was just kind of like asking him, I don't remember what I asked him, but I basically remember him saying to me, you don't take seriously what I'm doing inside of you. And, uh, and I really felt like he was putting his finger on something that he's also been putting his finger on here as a body. About a month ago, uh, before um, Sozo Church came, uh, is it okay if I share this? You don't even know what I'm about to share, but I'm, it's like one of those token permission requests. Like, you good? All right, cool. Yeah. <laughs> ah, I love it. Um, you know, Sandy was like uh, sensing something in worship. She's like, gosh, it's like, what is going on? It's like we're hitting a wall or, or whatever, but it didn't feel like a spiritual resistance, like there was something opposing us. It felt like there was just like this wall, and her and Patty got together, and Patty was sharing how uh, when she was in worship, we were talking about you're the God of the city and all this stuff, and Patty heard the Lord tell her they don't believe this. And... Uh, and, you know, no condemnation. You're good. You just got to believe more. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just playing. <laughs> but here's the point. Um, God's putting in his finger on something and he's exposing something. Um, and, and we got uh, insight into what that was when Sozo Church came because um, uh, as a team, they started sensing something. And they were like, you know, this is like a an awesome, awesome body of believers. Like they are so mature and so um, uh, versed in the things of God, but there's just something. It's as if, uh, it's as if they, there's like unbelief. And, and it was like, it's not unbelief in God. It's unbelief that God could use us. And that word was like, yep, that's it. That is it. Uh, and, and that's what God was telling me. He's like, you don't take seriously what I'm doing in you. And that's what Paul was saying to them. You don't understand what took place when Christ actually came into your life or when he spoke you into existence. Like, you, you think that you can put on these cultural changes and, and that's what you're supposed to do as your response? Stop it, knock it off, stay at your post. Remain where you are. Remain in the stance and position where you are because in that place you're going to see God move, but you got to believe that he can use you. You got to believe. You can't, you can't say, yeah, but God, you don't know. He's like, yes, I, I do know. And I paid for it. Like I, I inspected that. Like It's like, uh, you know, uh, he, he looked under the house, on top of the house, everything, and he still paid the price. 
And then he paid the price to upgrade the whole house. Now the house is perfect and you need to stop remembering all the rats that were in your crawl space before. You need to stop remembering uh, that foundation that was sagging. You need to stop remembering that bro those cracks because they're not even there anymore. But you're in the backyard trying to point out, look, God, see, it's there and, and, it, and it's not there. And you're like, no, but I swear it was there. And, and you're that crazy person in the backyard trying to convince somebody. And it's like, no, that's not there anymore. And guess what? When you try to preserve your deadness, or your old self with you, it's a version of insanity. And you start looking like that crazy person. But yet that's kind of where we are when we don't believe that God could use us. And we don't believe and we disqualify ourselves. We, we, we take ourselves out of the race because we're partnering with shame or partnering with fear. But why don't we start to partner with the spirit of the Lord and he can kick those things out. Amen. <laughs> Now I'm going to go back to reading my sermon. All right. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Cool. But, you know, Jesus called us to be the salt and light. And, uh, and salt is used to preserve. Light is used to bring light and displace darkness. And Jesus said, don't put your light under a basket. Put it on a high place where it can cast light where you are. And do not... Uh, well, I don't know, with the salt, there was some other stuff. But, but basically the point is this, it's not my point, all right? The point is this, all right? Salt is used to preserve. Salt is cast and spread to preserve. And uh, when you got saved, God didn't say, okay, all the salt, come back and go to the church building. We aren't called to fill up the church with salt. Salt is used as an example because it's used as a, as a casting and a broad thing. That wherever you are, wherever you are placed as a kingdom operative, you are there and you bring preservation to the people. You bring light to the people. You bring light to the darkness and you bring light. And, and you start to uh, have uh, the godly things that exist within that area be exposed and, and, and uncovered and dusted away. And all the other stuff gets to run away because it doesn't like the light of God. Amen. So in the poorest place and the richest place in the earth, you will find yourself a believer. In the darkest places and in the lightest places, Christ can be found in any situation where you find yourself in. My point is this. God has called you to bring the kingdom where you are and has placed you where you were when you got saved for a purpose and our remaining in that place as much as we are able can transform that space for his purposes. We need new lenses for our present state. And regardless of our role to play in that, Paul emphasizes first the most important thing, our being called to Jesus. That's the key for all of us. It's our being called to Jesus, that we all have a unique calling to Jesus, and he's called us to himself. And in that is all the recipe we need, because as we stay true to that, he begins to give us the, the purposes and plans for where he has us. Awesome. So, uh, so I'm going to read. So now we're going to uh, unpack those two uh, examples that, that Paul gives us. It's going to be a lot of fun. So verse 17, it says, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek uh, circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. So first of all... Uh, if you're circumcised, you should not become uncircumcised. Like I read that and I was like, uh, is that a thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, move <laughs> on, dude. But I'm still 13. Come on. Um, just kidding. But I, apparently it is. It's called epispasm. All right. All right. There you go. You can Google that. Um, anyways, keep moving. Stop. Move on. Move on. Sandy's like, stop. <laughs> 
Uh, hey, Teresa Hamilton said, have fun. So I am, I'm sorry. Okay, so I repent. All right, so, so but what is circumcision? Um, in the Old Covenant, it existed to signify that you were in covenant with God. It was an external uh, symbol um, that signified your covenant or membership in uh, the covenant with the Lord. Um, so to break that down, circumcision is talking about external religion and culture, which had nothing to do with the heart and the Spirit's work in the heart. Paul drives this home in Romans 2.28 when he says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. So what Paul's saying is, is that uh, circumcision, even in the law, isn't even an outward thing. It, it, it's an outward thing representing an inward reality. And so what he's saying is like, look, it's, it's not about that, and you don't need to change that. So for us, how do we make this personal? Because this was very relevant at the time. It's not as relevant today. So for us, you know, circumcision is a marking. It marked people. So what are the things that mark us or that signify externally who we are? Maybe this is a political affiliation or a brand we wear or certain people we follow on social media that signify we think a certain way or a bumper sticker we have or a hashtag we are using you get the point. Anytime we are making our identity outside of Christ, that's, that, that's where it can go. That's what Paul is calling out. He's saying, don't put your identity in this external marking that signifies to everyone around you who you are by that marking. Oh, he's circumcised? Cool, I know. Well, I mean, anyways, he wouldn't. How? All right. But I'm just saying like, you know, um, oh, you're uh, putting this hashtag. Or, oh, you follow such and such. Or, oh, I saw you like that post. Or, oh, uh, you know. And it's so rampant today to the point that um, our external markings are, are, are trying to override what actually matters. And, you know, the other day I popped a tire and uh, I was on the freeway. It was at night. God's good. I pulled over, luckily. And uh, it was bad. Like, whatever tires were on that, it was bad. So um, I didn't know what a retread was, but I found out, okay? Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, QR code. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Long story short... I pull over, and uh, within maybe five minutes, the police show up, and I was so happy. I was so happy because uh, they, they were there guarding me. They were bright, and they were just, like, had their flashlights. They, they ended up helping change the tire and everything, and, uh, and I was just really grateful. Um, and so I went home, and I was like, I want to honor them, but this thing came up, and I was like, no, nah, but if I honor the police, it's going to look like I'm trying to be like Blue Lives Matter. <laughs> and I don't want to, I don't want to be seen a certain way or I don't want to be judged like, th and I was like, I could give a rip if I'm seen this way or that way when, when we, because I needed to honor them because what they did blessed me and my family. And so, uh, and there's, there's going to be moments where you're met with this uh, crossroads of are you going to move forward um, uh, past the cultural uh, resistance um, that is aiming to cause us to be in this uh, current or are we going to be operated by the current of heaven? You know, it says in Ephesians, it says you've been brought out of 
the darkness and into a, really a new current. It's like a river that, that you brought out of the current. You no longer flow based on the current, but you flow based on, on heaven. And, and granted, there's going to be times where I follow that and I get the applause. And there's going to be other times where I follow that and everybody's going to be looking and wondering if I turned, uh, you know, such and such way. So if you're... Uh, if you're anchor is in the applause of the people, you're going to be tossed to and fro. You will never have an anchor to stand on or a rock to stand on or whatever. Don't stand on the anchor because you'll be underwater. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? (laughs) But you will never have a rock to stand on. You will be like that person that uh, builds their house on sand. And when everything flows, you're going to flow wherever the water goes. But if you allow what the Lord has done in you to shape your convictions, then you'll always be able to trace back your decisions back to why you can confess this hope inside. And it's going to go back to a true integritous, that's not a word, but, you know, thing that, that when you ring it, it doesn't rattle. It goes all the way through and resounds. It's going to be a true sound, and it's going to hold integrity. Amen. So anything we are making our identity outside of Christ, any marking, anything uh, needs to be judged and, and put back to its proper place. So what's the point? Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. They don't matter. The outward display or rituals that come along with following God aren't what is important. It is the keeping of the commandments of God that matters. And some might say, well, what do you mean? Wasn't being circumcised um, a commandment of God? Well, Paul included these in the same sentence to prove the, the, the new purpose to the people who were trying to be rule followers and saying, no, to follow the commandments of God is to be obedient to God, which is to follow Jesus who satisfied the Mosaic law. So your new reality isn't based on your ability to keep these rules or to follow in line or to use these different hashtags. It's literally to follow Jesus and to trust in him. So your hashtag is nothing. The person you follow on Instagram is nothing. If it is it has become an identifier of who you are, it has made an idol It has been made an idol, and it needs to be put back to where it belongs. Does that mean you don't use hashtags anymore? Yes. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Hashtags are bad. No. um, No, Paul says, remain in the condition you were in when you were saved, but remember that the main purpose of staying in that condition is to be salt and light. And I want you to hear this. And if you aren't being an influencer there, you are being influenced. So if you are being influenced and it's by the, not by the kingdom, then get out of there. Get out as soon as possible. Regroup with the Lord and say, okay, what's my assignment? I'm sorry. I messed up. He say, it's all good. Follow me. Another thing to draw from this is that Paul is highlighting the culture of the the people in Corinth. You could basically say that um, uh, being circumcised or being a Jew is nothing. Being uncircumcised or being a Gentile is nothing. And that was really triggering to the people then. So just so I can up it a notch just to make sure we're we're all there together... um, If you were saved as an American, you don't need to become a non-American. But being an American is nothing. Now, to relieve the tension, (laughs) being a Canadian is nothing. (laughs) Oh, boom. Just kidding. (laughs) Sorry. That was inappropriate and childish. I repent to my Canadian wife. I love you. Oh, yeah, and Keith, sorry. You're American now, so it's all good. Her stuff hasn't gone through yet, so. 
Okay. All right. I'm just trying to be obedient, guys, okay? We're going to have fun, okay? Here's the reality. Our, citizen, our citizenship and identity is no longer in our culture. It is in Jesus. So it would be irrelevant to change your culture to try to look more Jewish or more, gen- or <laughs> more Gentile. <laughs> What's a Gentile? <laughs> More Gentile. Uh, more Canadian or more American. More black, more white, more Asian, more native, more whatever. Paul said, remain where you are. Remember... Ephesians 3.10 says, we communicate the, the manifold wisdom of God. So if you don't remain where you are, you don't shine the goodness of God from how he created it. So for instance, every tribe and every tongue is going to be in heaven uh, praising the Lord. And it's going to release a sound that, that we haven't even seen yet because we haven't seen true unity on the earth that, that is in heaven. But make no mistake that God placed you where you are. God made you how you are. Remain there. Honor it. And as you honor it, God's going to do something through you that will uh, teach the angels. And that will enable them to be able to actually praise God with understanding. And they're going to be more in awe by what they see through us. So that's a very true reality. But then Paul says, but do not put your culture above the kingdom. Because you putting your culture above the kingdom will never put all the pieces together. It will never, uh, it it will never, the only way that we can heal our nation is to, is to repent. For all of the times when we tried to put our culture onto other cultures and try to uh, create a, a kingdom of our culture yeah. instead of the kingdom of heaven. And that's built through huma- humility and reconciliation and honor. And it's built through the wisdom of God. Yeah. We don't understand it. We just need to be obedient and remain truthful to what he's called us to be where we are. Amen. Amen. Okay, next point, uh, verse 21 to 24. So it says, uh, were you a slave when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself to the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, There let him remain with God. All right, so something to point out. The Roman institution of slavery uh, was a lot different than the institution of slavery that we saw in uh, America. Very different. Um, uh, And the bond servants in in Rome uh, were actually known to be able to, they earned a wage and they ended up... uh, were able to purchase their freedom within their time. And so that's the context of what he's bringing. Um, And by no means is because he brought this up some uh, justification uh, for the uh, institution of slavery Um, because, you know, we see in uh, 1 Timothy 1.10, just slavery is an abomination. And so uh, why did Paul bring it up? Well, I say that to say that Paul is really highlighting um, the, the nature of what happens in someone when they get saved. The transformation that happens. And he's using this to highlight, you know, where he talks about culture and uh, an external religion. Now he's talking about freedom and what it means to follow Jesus and its relation to true slavery. 
which is actually true freedom. What? Okay. Anyway, you're like, what are you talking about, dude? I'll get to it. Okay, so, all right. So Paul shows us that if you are enslaved to someone, know this. Your freedom isn't rooted in man, but in Jesus. Your perspective is now anchored in freedom. True freedom cannot be taken by man. When we are in Christ and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. True freedom is freedom from sin and the righteousness that comes from Jesus. And so what, what Paul is saying is, yeah, if you are a slave or a bond servant, yeah, um, uh, if you can get free, get free. Absolutely, get free. He's not telling you to stay in slavery. But he's saying your status as a bond servant is not your status before the Lord. That your status before the Lord is that you are the Lord's freed man. And if you serve wherever you are with that reality, it's going to transform the reality where you are. And if you are a free person and not a slave to someone, he addresses that. He says, um, you know, so a question is, do you get to do whatever you want to do with your freedom? Do you get to live with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Smoke a little weed here. Use that freedom to tear down another person that doesn't agree with you politically. By no means. Oh, snap, dagger. Um, Paul is slaying. Is, Paul is, he is slaying. He's slaying. He sure is. This is good. <laughs> Woo! Lay it. All right. Paul is saying, you should remember that you are Jesus' slave. And your freedom comes from him and not from your social status. And since you belong to Jesus, he has ownership over your life to direct it and use it as the best way he sees fit to display the kingdom. And we celebrate living as slaves because we know that that is true sweet freedom. This is, you know, more the area of the focus for the North American church. You know, we want our freedom and we want Jesus. Uh, and yet Paul is calling us to remember that we are Christ's slaves and Jesus told us to count the cost. How you walk in the midst of oppressive situations displays the kingdom. And how you deny yourself certain freedoms because of your allegiance to Christ displays the kingdom as well. It's a matter of true freedom. You know, some of the deliverance stories uh, we have heard lately, um, because we've really been going after uh, true breakthrough in freedom. Um, But some of the stories that we've heard lately have involved people being tormented and oppressed by the devil. In some cases, there have been open doors that were uh, there through sins that people were still walking in. Maybe sex outside of marriage, maybe unforgiveness or secretly looking at pornography. These are all things that represent the rights of a person who is free in the world's perspective, but they have become doors to slavery. Paul is telling us that true freedom is becoming a bondservant to Jesus and running like a gazelle. (laughs) Like that. He did it better. Um, You can go back and see that. You should go back. And now we're going to insert that clip here for the replay. Okay. But running like a gazelle to slam the doors on the areas of compromise, just like the people who have gotten deliverance and ran to throw away their porn or weed stash or break up with that boyfriend or girlfriend they've been living with. I feel like I've been going after that one a lot. Sorry. Um, This is what freedom looks like. And the sooner we embrace This slavery to Christ, the sooner we embrace true freedom and breakthrough. For the enslaved person, your focus reality is now freedom being Christ's freedman. For the freed person, your focus is now that you are a bondservant to Christ. Your life no longer belongs to you, but to him who bought you at a price. That is what it means to be a Christian. To To the bound person, you are now free. And to the free, you are now bound. Jesus says, count the cost. And we all must assess what it means for us to follow Christ from where we are. There's a calling or purpose in your condition. Uh, 
the, the position that you were in when Christ called you was not by accident. I want to highlight that by looking at the life of Moses. Psych, just kidding. All right, so if you got saved and you were super, I lost my notes, I'm back now. Okay, so if you got saved and you were a super successful real estate agent, uh, you don't need to like quit that and then become a pastor to validate the call of God in your life. You can uh, sell homes and still be successful and do it as you're in communion with God. You know, we saw that, uh, that uh, Troy Brewer Ministries found a way to convert money into freedom for people. And we need more people in industries and in, uh, in uh, areas of influence to where we can, uh, to where we can, we can leverage that for, for the kingdom. But make sure it's in the right position. You can glorify God selling homes. Um, yeah, that's good. Oh, technology. I love it. All right, so if you were raised in a conservative household... Let God use it. If you were raised in a liberal household, just kidding. No. <laughs> I'm just playing. Let him use it. Seriously. Let him use it. If you, you are now God's sent ones in these industries, in these sectors of life, with the paradigm of heaven transforming the reality of that sphere with the reality of heaven. Your upbringing is a platform for you to launch from. Look at the life of Moses. He was raised in the house of Pharaoh, taught the ways of Egyptian royalty. And yet when God encountered him as as the burning bush, he called him back to the place where he was raised with a new paradigm. And what was the result? He confronted the most powerful nation and all of the demonic powers that it was built upon. And he did this with the power of God, now working on his behalf and his people's behalf to bring about freedom from the very kingdom that he grew up in. God didn't save us to send us to a church building. Jesus said, go, therefore, into all the earth. That term go can also be stated as you go. Meaning, as Paul said about the condition, the matter of life you lived when you were saved, go and bring Jesus from that place. So this looks like a diverse and innumerable set of expressions. Sounds manifold. So therefore, if you are at Microsoft or the Gates Foundation or the government or um, the education sector or you're a counselor or you're a doctor or bring the kingdom there. Bring the kingdom where you are. And, and, and do this from your primary calling. Our primary calling is to Jesus. That doesn't change when you're at your job. That doesn't change when uh, you're faced with something that you don't understand on how to bring the kingdom there. It still is the reality. And as you behold him and as you put him as your primary calling, he'll lead you and guide you and direct you on how to do that. So, and if that calling is something that you feel is hindering you, either he can interrupt your perspective or you need to put the place that that calling has in the right perspective. But the the answer is not to leave and become a pastor. That's not the answer. You know, like that's not how you validate your call. On the earth. So if there's any circumstance that we are using as an excuse to justify a belief that we cannot honor and serve God with our lives, then we need to repent. If I was only a pastor, I'd be serving God with my life. Or if I was a missionary, your career isn't an inhibition to your calling. Your culture isn't an inhibition to your calling. Your upbringing isn't an inhibition to your calling. Your calling is to serve and honor God, to live in communion with Him, to live a life devoted to Him. Everything else is subject or subservient, or nothing, as he says in comparison. So uh, if I can have uh, Melanie come up. She's so good. She's like, my bad, was I supposed to come up? Um, 
No, I'm not, I'm not as versed. Out of, out of season, in and out of season, guys, always ready. So check it out. Um, I, I think that there's two things that God wants to do. He wants to have us repent of our unbelief that he can use us. We all need to come into agreement that, that, that we need to repent. We can stand up. So I'm just gonna just gonna have fun and you can you can follow me in that. Uh, repeat after me. Lord, I'm sorry for not taking seriously what you are doing in me. I repent for not believing that you could want to and can use me for your purposes. So Jesus, I ask you to forgive me and I thank you for your blood that covers that sin and that mindset. I ask you now, Lord, to judge that mindset, to take that away and replace with it a knowledge that you want to use me where I am for mighty purposes to bring your kingdom. Take the scales off my eyes and cause me to see what you're doing. So you can stop repeating. And Lord, I just thank you, God. I thank you, Lord, for, for these saints, for these uh, activated ones, for these kingdom operatives in all these different sectors of society. And I thank you, God, that we are here together. I praise you, God, that we get to gather together. Lord, that when we divide out the purposes for why we're here, we realize we're not here to hunker down and hide. We're here to, hunk, uh, to, to rally together, to encourage one another, to spur one another, one another on in the mighty calling that they are expressing through them living obediently to you, Lord. So I thank you, God. I honor our gathering time. I repent for any time that, uh, that we have uh, uh, cursed our, our gathering time, Lord. Lord, that this is such a precious time because we are your body. And let your body be made manifest in all the earth, in all the places where we are, God. So right now, I just, I bless each and every one here. I bless each and every one here with that blessing that Sandy said earlier. That the Lord bless you and keep you. That he make your, his face shine upon you. That he would surround you. I'm just winging it now. But Lord, that, <laughs> that he would increase you. Blessing means to increase and expand. So Lord, I declare a blessing and an increase over everyone here where you've placed them. In the, in the sales force. In the in the in the. In the everywhere that it just expands yeah 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 i'm reminded of phil phil seaton who who uh was uh him and sorry you're like are we praying or what all right but i'm I'm reminded of phil seaton because he he and uh and jane ran this construction company and then the lord called him to be the executive director of uh of providence heights which is an amazing transitional uh, ministry that is launching women who have uh, just come up on some true brokenness and, and God's putting this super team together to help them put their pieces together and become the fullness of who God's called them to be. I mean, I totally butchered it, uh, what, what they're doing, because what God is doing through them is a kingdom, Epcot assignment. It's incredible. And, and here's the thing. Phil was like, what are you doing, Lord? Why am I a construction uh, sensei, you know, that, that's been doing this, now an executive director of a nonprofit, but God is now doing something through him that only he could do. And so you guys, you don't know why God brought you through that, but just be grateful 
that he's going to use it to your benefit. He's going to use it to do something that you never could have understood, and it's going to be far beyond uh, what you could ever ask for, think, or imagine. Sounds familiar. So, so Lord, I bless these people. I bless them with the fullness of what you've called them to. And I thank you, God, that, uh, that we're all going to be running uh, towards you together with confidence and with strength in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless, bless you. Come on. So, uh, you know, parents, you got to go get your kids and everything. And, uh, but uh, if the ministry team could come, we want to pray for you guys and, uh, and agree with you and bless you even further if you need that. So uh, God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. Happy Sunday. So good to have you here today with us. Say, so, just wanted to let you know that we have some really awesome events that are coming up soon. And to keep you in the loop, here are your announcements. If you are a young adult, we want to invite you next week, Sunday, uh, to come to the cafe for a special meet and greet. This is just for the young adults. So if you're between the ages of college and 39, uh, we just want to invite you to our cafe following first service if you go to first service and second service if you go to second. And uh, yeah, it's just going to be a great time to meet some of our young adult leaders, uh, connect and find out more about our young adults ministry. Hey, and on your way into service this morning, you might have received one of these brochures. This is our winter connect group catalog. And inside you're going to find all kinds of interesting groups from parenting to exercise, dream interpretation, singles, and many, many others. Uh, so be sure to check that out. Uh, if you didn't uh, get one of these, just go to srcconnectgroups.com. You can look at our full list of current groups and you can also sign up online as well. If you are new to SRC, we want to invite you to our next upcoming welcome lunch that's happening February 14th. It's just following the 11 a.m. service. And so to register for that, you'll just need to go online to our website. You can also scan the QR code that you'll find in this morning's bulletin. We're also excited to announce that our women's tea talks are up and running starting on February 6th. Uh, so ladies, be sure to mark your calendars for the first Saturday of every month and join us for a time of faith building conversation, uh, tea and treats, and just a really great time of fellowship with the ladies of SRC. And that's just a little look into what's happening in the beginning part of 2021. Uh, for more events and information about other happenings at SRC, be sure to stay tuned to our website.